so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The devil is trying to pervert the scriptures. But your Bible, your King James Bible, is not perverted. There's nothing perverted in the King James Bible, although there may be some of you in here that hold a King James Bible that have a perversion in it. Did you know there are errors in some King James Bibles? Bear with me for a second. Not in the text. In the footnotes, I want to show this to you because, again, God's Word is perfect, it's preserved, it's powerful, it's profitable unto you. In Jeremiah 23, he says, For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts. They are trying to pervert the Bible. The devil will do anything he can to pervert the Bible. He wants to trick you into using a New King James or an NIV or a DOA, right? One of these funny Bible versions that are not accurate. And the devil has been trying to pervert God's Word from the very beginning. What did he say to Eve in the garden? In Genesis 3 it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not, shall not eat of every tree of the garden? From the beginning, the devil's trying to cause doubt in the promises of God. But listen, I want you to understand, you can have confidence in the Word of God. The character of God's Word is that it's true forever. You can trust it. But yet, there are some King James Bibles that have something wrong. And I want to show this to you. Go to Hebrews chapter 13 at the very last verse, verse 25. I want to show you the devil's perversion. Look how he ends here. He says, Grace be with you all. Amen. There's the salutation. But some Bibles will have a footnote at the end. Who has, whose Bible has a footnote at the end? Where it says, Written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy. Where did that come from? Did you notice it's below? This is a subtext. This is subscript. This is not in the verse, but this has been added in. Well, where does it come from? Why is it there? This is very under, important. I want, to, I want to share this. This is kind of a neat thing. The devil's trying to pervert the Word of God by causing doubt in any way he can. Yea, hath God said. Right? Well, what's he say here? Written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy. Now, let me ask you this, men. Who in here believes that Hebrews was written by Timothy? Who believes it was written by Paul? Amen. Amen. Well, this is very important. Why? Because look, in this chapter, look at verse 23. Hebrews 13, verse 23, it says, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Well, now, wait a minute. In verse 23, he's talking to Timothy. And after verse 25, it says, Well, written by Timothy. Well, is that not a contradiction? Now, either Paul wrote 13 books, and Hebrews is in question, or Paul wrote 14 books. I believe Paul wrote 14 books under the power of the Holy Spirit. You see it in the introduction. You see it in the manner of speech. You see it in the signature. You see it in his style of signature. He ends. We're going to give a signature test. He says, grace be with you all. Amen. Right? He says the same thing in Romans 16. At the end, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I want to look at the signature at the end of 1 Corinthians 16. At the end of 2 Thessalonians, he says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And in the book of Titus, chapter 3, at the end, he says, All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the face. Grace be with you all. Amen. It's the same signature we see in the book of Hebrews. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Look at verse number 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the same signature that Paul uses in all of his other books. There's a lot of ways to prove that Paul is the author, and that's not really what this is about. I just want to highlight the errors in the subtext or the footnotes in certain Bibles. Now, not every Bible will do this. Your Holman Bibles will typically, they have a whole section at the end in the concordance where they have this information. Your Thomas Nelson will put it as a header text at the beginning of the chapter. Certain publishers, like Church Bible Publishers and others, they put it right there at the end. But where did this come from? This is actually, it was introduced around the 5th or 6th century only in the Alexandrian texts. Only in the Alexandrian text. And eventually, it made it into the Texas Receptus. While we're in 1 Corinthians 16, look at verse number 24. My love be with you all, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now look at the subtext. For those that have it, it says, The first epistle 
to the Corinthians was written from Philippi by Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaeus and Timotheus. Now there's a problem here. He's saying it's written from Philippi. For those that don't know, Philippi is in Macedonia. But look at verse number 8 in this chapter. 1 Corinthians 16, 8, the Bible says, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Well, where's Ephesus? Look at verse 19. The churches of Asia salute you. So what's the, the Black Sea is basically separating Macedonia and Asia. So you've got Philippi over by Thessalonica. You've got Ephesus, two totally different cities. And it's clear that he's saying, I'm over here. But whoever added this note says, well, no, he was over here. Why would you do such a strange thing? Why and how did these things become introduced? I think it's strange fruit and strange doctrine. I want, to, I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And listen, I tell you these things to, so that you, not to cause you to doubt the King James Bible, but rather to have confidence in everything in the King James Bible. Uh, most, if not all, of these subtexts can be debunked simply by using the Bible itself. History also contradicts many of these subtexts. There's a problem with 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, where at the end of it it says it's written from Athens, but both of those chapters, in the beginning it says written by Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, which we know from Acts chapter 18 that they were together at Corinth. So according to the Bible, the three of them were working together from Corinth, but yet the subtext says that they were in Athens. Well, that's a contradiction. Why would you do that? Why would you cause doubt on the Word of God? I believe it was written by a God-hater, by, by, by someone trying to cause confusion. Uh, you're in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Go to the end there. Look at verse number 21. Which some, professing, have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Now that's the end of the Bible, but then the subtext, look what it says. The first to Timothy was written from Laodicea, which is the chiefest city of Phrygia Pacataena. There's a problem with this. This city, Phrygia, is in the Bible. You can find it in three other places. But the city in the third or fourth century was divided. And the Pacatina, or Tiana, is referring to the major part of the city and the minor part of the city, and that didn't happen until 400 years after this was written. So it's mentioning a portion of a city that didn't even exist when this was written. Clearly these, these subtexts were added after the fact. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter number 4. So it claims to be written from somewhere that it was not. And again, most if not all of the subscript can be debunked simply by using the Bible. And so I encourage you, if you have it in your Bible, just cross it out or white it out, or just know what the truth is. Just understand that someone, for some reason, has injected this into the Word of God, and, and it has made it into certain copies. And again, like Thomas Nelson, it's at the header. You don't see it at the foot. It's at the beginning of the chapter. Holman's, they put it at the very end of the Bible. They put all of it together where you can read a summary of the chapters, and they use that information. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Go to the end. Verse number 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Now that's the end of the Bible, and here's the footnote. The second epistle unto Timotheus, ordained to be the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians, was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero the second time. Now there is no biblical or historical proof that Timothy was a bishop. There is none whatsoever. In fact, in this chapter, if you go back to verse number 5, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 5. It says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. His ministry was to be an evangelist. And as an evangelist, he was taught by Paul the apostle to go and find older men and ordain them as bishops. Right. Now, it, this is important because what he's trying to say is, well, Timothy must have been a bishop also, but it's not true. In fact, he's called a youth. Timothy is unqualified from these standards to be a bishop. Right. 
Well, why does this matter, Brother Fan? What's the point in it? Well, there are people that preach bad doctrine based on bad information. And when you're given the correct information, will you correct your doctrine? You know, because the Catholic hierarchy teaches that, you know, that it's it's not mean it does, the Bible doesn't mean older, it means el you know, elders are really bishops or pastors or teachers. They, they try to take the word elder and turn it into something. It is not because of, you know, the diocese and the pope and their bishops and their hierarchy. Now, why does it matter? Well, if you believe what the Bible teaches, that Timothy was an evangelist, it makes sense why he was always traveling and over multiple churches. Because a local church bishop or pastor should not be leaving his flock. He should not be leaving his family, and he is of that flock. He's not somebody that's over a multitude or over a country. That's Catholic doctrine. Right. So it does matter. It does affect doctrine. I want you to go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I want, I want to show you from the Bible the source of this error. People can change doctrine with footnotes. That's been the goal all along. And I buy a, a Bible only. This is only the Bible. It's from Church Bible Publishers. No footnotes. I don't want the foot. I don't want their stinking Schofield. They can keep it. It's wicked in what it teaches. And yet, what do I get? Footnotes in my King James. Well, how did that happen? How did the Catholics get in my King James Bible? I don't like that. What can I do about it? Well, like I said, scratch it out, white it out. You have the same problem in the book of Titus where it mentions a city, uh, Nicopolis of Macedonia, but yet that city is not there. It's not in Macedonia. Same problem there. And at the end of it, he says, Come unto me in Nicopolis, for I have determined to winter there. In the chapter, he says, I am going to go to Nicopolis. I will winter there. Meet me there. But yet it says it was written from there. It doesn't even make sense. He writes him a letter and says, meet me in this city. And then the Catholics change the footnotes and say, it was written from that city. The problem is they got the wrong country. It's not in Macedonia. So who perverted the manuscripts? Who added these erroneous footnotes and why? Well, the fact is no one is actually really sure. Now, this is the strange thing. Well, it could have been this guy. It could have been that guy. It could have been in the 5th century. It could have been in the 7th century. They don't really know. Now, this, this boggles my mind. This is strange. We know where the manuscripts come from. We know of the people it speaks of. We know of the cities it speaks of. But all of the footnotes mention things that don't add up according to the scriptures. Sounds like a conspiracy to me. Right? Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. No, I'm a conspiracy realist. I realize there's a conspiracy to change the Bible by the devil, and we can fight it. I'm going to scratch out these, these footnotes. I'm not going to base doctrine on these footnotes. This is very So who perverted the manuscripts? Well, one thing we do know for a fact. The source was Alexandrian footnotes. They, it was a guy that claimed to be a, first he claimed to be a deacon, and then claimed to be a bishop of an Alexandrian, which Catholic Greek church. It's not the Christian church. And then this was gathered by Erasmus and put into the Textus Receptus. And so there were a lot of things in the 1611 that didn't make it in the final cut, and there were some things that did. So this came through on certain Bibles. You're in Acts chapter 11. I want you to understand the difference. Why we're here is to understand the difference between Alexander and Antioch. Alexander and and Antioch. If you look at Jerusalem and you go north, you will find Antioch. But from Jerusalem, if you go west into Egypt, that's where Alexander is and that's where the perversion came from. The majority of the text and what we have in our Bible, of the 5,000 plus manuscripts that we have, 99% of them came from Antioch. And that is what the Textus Receptus is. It is the received text. It is called the Byzantine text. It is the majority text. So of the 5,000, 99% don't have these footnotes. And they are accurate. But then there's that 1%. It's called the critical text because that 1% wants to criticize the majority. So understanding that, look at Acts chapter 11. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Go to Acts 13. So where did the name Christian come? The city called Antioch, north of Jerusalem. They're expelled from Jerusalem. It's not about that city. It's about the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they took with them the truth. That became a hub of Christianity in that time. They were known as Christ followers from Antioch, and of course the scriptures were published there as well. We're going to see that, Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 1. Now there were 
in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. Just stop right there. So I just want to set the context of where we're at in this chapter. He, he tells them, they start there, they send some men off. Go to verse 14, Acts 13, verse 14. Of Paul, it says, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So they come back to Antioch. So obviously Antioch is a hub. So here he is. He comes back to Antioch. There's a lot happening here. Go to the end of the chapter. Find verse number 49. So Paul is preaching in Antioch there. At the end of what he's preaching, look what it says in verse 49. It says, And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. The word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Where? Antioch. So the scriptures that originate in Antioch do not have these footnotes. They are 99% in agreement, and there's over 5,000 of them that are identical and the same. Look, we can trust the words of the living God. And if your Bible has a, a, you know, some Bibles will change a word and put it over in the corner and say, well, this word really means that. You can ignore that. Sometimes it's accurate, but don't depend on that. These Bibles put the footnotes. Sometimes you can learn something. Like there's the uh, there, there's one uh, I forget. Brother Luke, what's the name of that Bible you have with the uh, creation footnotes? Henry Morris Study Bible. That's, yeah, the Henry Morris Study Bible. It has some really neat scientific footnotes, and that's great to add to your faith. But that, our faith is not in Henry Morris or in his footnotes. Okay, so the same thing, when you see these footnotes or a, a header or a subfoot, don't put your trust in that, but you can trust the Word of God. What we have here always has been. I, I want you to go to Acts chapter 6. So the Texas Receptus is the King James Bible. And it came from Antioch, north of Jerusalem. So where did the footnotes come in, these scripts from? They came from Alexandria. That is the critical minority text. That is the text that the heretics James White and Jeff Durbin and you know, uh, Dr. Brown, all of these guys love because it's of the devil. It's of their father, the devil. It wants to criticize the Word of God and add to it to support their Jesuit Catholic doctrine. You're in Acts chapter 6. Look at verse number 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, you know this chapter. This is the chapter where they stone Stephen. Well, what's the reputation of the man? Where do they come from? Oh, uh, Alexandrians. Oh, the Libertines. We're here to set you at liberty. No, you're not. You don't know liberty. You don't have liberty. You don't have the right Bible. So the critical minority text was able to get these footnotes placed in some King James Bibles. And listen, I don't say this to cause confusion or cause you to doubt your Bible. Again, if you have that below the Scripture, just cross it out. Just know that it is not Scripture. Know for a fact that each and every one of these, just about, as far as I can tell, can be debunked with the Bible and also with history. Look, God loves us so much, He sent His Son to die for us. God loves us so much, He's given us His Word so we can learn of Him. He has magnified His Word above His very own name. Now that's character. He's saying, listen, this is the promise I've given to you. This is a covenant. It will not fail. Not one word. And every word you have in your King James Bible is profitable unto you. It's perfect. It's preserved. And it has power. Thank God for the Bible. That's the character of God. He wants you to have that. He doesn't want you to wonder or doubt. He wants you to have the answer book because it's a love letter. So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty.